Well, thank you. Uh, please, uh, if you all find your seats, I would like to start this event. Thank you all for coming on such a beautiful San Francisco day uh, and finding, uh, finding one of the few topics I think that is even more enticing than the, beautiful, the, the natural weather that uh, we're enjoying these days. Uh, my name is Christopher Yu. I am a, I guess my title is the John H. Professor of Law, Communication, Computer, and Information Science. Um, I, so I hold appointments in three departments, uh, three different parts of the school. But in addition, uh, before I went to business school, I, was a, I went to law school, I went to business school first and practiced business for a while. And so um, it just goes to show that I can't keep a job and I have an extremely short attention span. Uh, but among other things, it makes it a, me a very natural person to bring this astounding group of people together that really, to me, represents the essence of what is, makes Penn so wonderful which is the commitment to interdisciplinary work and the ability to bring together different schools of thought in ways that create so much creativity and foster so much great innovation in the way we think about things. Uh, this is the first of several efforts across the school <coughs> to increase the University of Pennsylvania's uh, presence out on the West Coast. This is uh, one experiment we're trying. Uh, we'd love to hear more from you uh, through this course of this, uh, in your feedback uh, during the course of the event. Just so you know, after we end, we adjourn at 7. We actually have the space out here until 7.30, and the bar will still be open. <laughs> uh, so we would, uh, to give us a chance to interact with you following this program as well, uh, one apology I need to make for those of you who don't know, the East Coast has been enjoying a bit of a winter weather the last uh, couple of days, and Sarah Hammer, who was originally scheduled to be on the program, uh, had her flights. Uh, flights last night and this morning canceled out from under her, so she will not be joining us. And uh, without further ado, I will turn the floor over to Ken Morbach. Hey. Yes, yeah, so first of all, thanks so much to Christopher and the, the Center for Technology, Innovation, and Competition at the Law School for instigating this, um, and uh, delighted to host it here at Wharton, San Francisco. Um, so I'm Kevin Werbeck, and I am going to be uh, an aggressive, active moderator slash participant. Uh, I teach at Wharton in legal studies, and blockchain and cryptocurrencies are now one of my primary research areas, as well as other issues related to emerging technologies. Um, next to me is David Hoffman. He is a professor at uh, the law school who uh, does work, among other things, on uh, contract law and smart contracts, which got him into some of the work he's going to talk about here. Uh, next in is Shaikat Chowdhury, uh, who leads the Mac Center for Innovation Management at Wharton uh, and is going to get us into some of the strategic and business issues around blockchain. And then David Crosby, uh, who is in computer science in Penn Engineering and also as a background as a serial uh, tech entrepreneur, um, will uh, focus on the technology aspects of this. So I thought I would get us started uh, by doing a little bit of uh, grounding and background. We're going to try to make this session as interactive as possible. Uh, we're, each person is going to speak for just a few minutes with some introductory remarks, and then we're going to have a conversation and fairly early on open it up to you to hear what you're interested in. Uh, but the first thing uh, I'm curious about is uh, what all of you bring to this. What I found, I, I just published a book on blockchain called The Blockchain and the New Architecture of Trust. So I've been doing a lot of going around to different kinds of venues and speaking about this topic. Uh, what I found is, first of all, you can have a room full of people who are all deeply, deeply convinced that blockchain is going to change the world, that this is a foundational disruptive technology that is going to be essential to business and society. And that's, that's a given. That's the starting point of everyone in that room. And then the next day you can be in a room full of people who are convinced the whole thing's a fraud, that it's not being used for anything, it's worthless, it's all failed, it's all a scam. Uh, and then there's a huge number of people who are just curious who just find this interesting, find it intriguing, but fundamentally just don't understand what's going on. So let me just uh, first just take a show of hands. How many of you feel like coming in here, you've got a, a really good understanding of just what blockchain is, whatever you think it is. How many of you feel like you're there? Okay, so that's about, about half the people. All right, so let me, let me give some setting of the context of my uh, answer to that question, uh, which for some of you will be a bit of review, but Frankly, one of the things that makes this phenomenon so interesting and also so challenging 
is that there's not just one way to describe it. It's not just one thing. And uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding. So I generally describe blockchain as a family of technologies for decentralized value exchange. So it's actually a whole collection of related technologies. Uh, it's very easy to get fixated on one implementation, say Bitcoin, which has a particular set of mechanisms for doing what's called consensus for doing the thing that Bitcoin was designed to create, which is a currency, a new kind of money. Uh, but there are other implementations of blockchain technology that look different. Some of them slightly different, some of them very different. Some of them so different where there's real disputes about whether it belongs in the same category as blockchain technology. I take a fairly broad view of this, that this is a spectrum. And I'm curious, you know, be interested to hear what the other panelists have to say. It's a spectrum of technologies. Some are totally decentralized or as decentralized as possible. Some require identity, so you know who's on the network, but no actor has control. Uh, some make uh, certain trade-offs, for example, to improve performance. Um, some make other sets of trade-offs. But what they all have in common is this idea that there's no central actor that's in control. It's decentralized in the sense that there is no reliance on a particular canonical source of information. No one entity that you have to trust to keep the master record or to be the intermediary or the institution in the center of all transactions. And yet it's a system for value exchange. So the internet is decentralized, but the internet's a system for moving information. You can have lots and lots of copies of the same documents and the same files on the internet, and there's no certainty that they're all the same, even though the document might look similar. For a system of value exchange, the assets themselves on the network have to be themselves unique or scarce and be the actual source of value. So one example of that is money. If you have a representation of money that's in an account somewhere, that's the money. It's not just uh, an entry in a database saying the money is over there. It's actually a representation of the money itself. Uh, but that's true of other things as well. It's true, for example, if you're going to have a system of record that's going to track where a shipping container is in the world that's moving some things across a supply chain. Again, you can have just information. But if you want to say, I am certain this represents the shipping container. So for example, if I want to borrow against um, the receivables based on what's in that shipping container, I need to be sure that I'm referencing the actual source of value on the network. And that's inherently hard to do on a decentralized network. Because traditionally, we have one central entity. It's the one that says, yes, this is how much you have. This is how much this one has. This is the official source of records. We can make copies of it, but there's one master copy. A decentralized system, like a blockchain system, has no master copy. Every actor on the network can have its own copy of the ledger, of the record of information, and yet they're all the same. And it's mathematically, uh, they have mathematical confidence based on the cryptography that everything is the same. Now, it gets a lot deeper and more sophisticated than that. Um, David, uh, I think, will get us a little bit more into the technology uh, once I hand it over. Uh, but that's the basic idea of blockchain. So why would you want to do that? Why would you want a system that is decentralized in this way? Why not just use the systems that we already have, uh, which rely on some central actor, some trusted third party, to manage the information and to ensure that the value is unique? Um, well, there's really two answers to that question. And ironically, they seem to be in conflict with each other. One answer is that sometimes trust is a problem. Sometimes trust is dangerous. Trust is dangerous from a security standpoint because it's a single point of failure. If there's a trusted entity, that's what uh, the security experts call an attack surface. If you can compromise the trusted entity, you've undermined the system. And there's only one point that's trusted in a centralized system. That's one danger. But another set of dangers is that if you have to trust someone, they can be untrustworthy. What if they accumulate power by virtue of being the core intermediary in the center of the network? We have a lot of discussion now in the tech world about the extreme power of certain dominant platforms. It's a decentralized internet, and yet power is really centralized because there's value in having those central entities, but there's also dangers there as well. So the idea of blockchain is potentially, on the one hand, dealing with this problem where there's too much trust where the trust is a downside.
But there's also a second side to this. And the second side to this is sometimes the problem is there's not enough trust. Sometimes the problem is there are actors who want to work together, companies that want to collaborate, people who want to work together in some sort of collaborative enterprise, but they don't fully trust each other. They're not willing to say, even though we're all working together, you can maintain the canonical records. I'll let you be the one who's in control of all the data. I'll share my data with you, but you're in control. Companies don't want to do that, even with companies that are, that are their partners. People don't want to do that. And so what happens is they each keep their own copy, even though uh, ultimately there's got to be agreement on the state of the network. Everyone keeps their own copy of the data. And when those copies are out of sync, there's a need for reconciliation. There's a need for a settlement process to get them back into sync. That's costly, leads to errors, leads to all sorts of problems and inefficiencies, and often leads to activities just not happening. And so if you look just a little bit below the surface at massive systems for business in the world today, like the global financial system, or the multi-trillion dollar supply chain processes that move goods all around the world, you look just a little bit below the surface, you very quickly find faxes, you find paper records, you find duplicative copies and all kinds of cruft built on top of them to deal with that. And so the promise of blockchain is what if we have a decentralized system? No one's in control, that means everyone can trust it. No one needs to keep their own independent copy because there's one shared source of truth. That's the potential. Also lots of challenges, also lots of dangers, also lots of legal and regulatory issues, and so that's what we're going to get into on the panel today. Um, I was going to joke that uh, the title is Blockchain Threat or Menace, uh, but I guess it's actually a little bit more optimistic. It's Hype or Hope. Uh, for those of you that are in this space, you know we've gone through a period in 2017 of unbelievable irrational exuberance and the price of the cryptocurrencies, the digital tokens that are built on some of these blockchain systems skyrocketing. And then uh, in the last year, a period where things came thudding back down to earth, and yet activity is still happening. There's actually, I think, much more going on in the blockchain world than people realize. So with that introduction, hopefully I've um, set the context. Let me ask each of the other panelists to say a few remarks, uh, and then we're going to have a discussion. We'll start at the far end with David Crosby. Thank you. I seem to be the only one here with a piece, without a piece of paper, so let's <laughs> see if I can frame my argument. Um, Kevin and I taught a course together, so I was always a little bit left speechless after he started. Um, the way that I see this is that we spent the last 10 to 15 years sorting out data within cyber organizations. Through SAP, Oracle, or two of the two big winners out of that process. But the process has essentially been how do you organize information flow inside an organization, inside a structure where there is a definite legal structure, where there's a command and control, where there's somebody in charge. And we've ended up in a situation now where there's a reasonably good system where if you're a suit manufacturer, you have some idea of how many chickens you can move to the door and some idea of how many cans coming out and where those cans are located and where the chickens are inside the plant. As soon as you go outside that plant door and you wonder where your chickens are coming from and you wonder where your cans go to, then things become murky. And we've had a whole series of um, limited ventures over the time to try and track. Uh, you look at the international cargo transfer process where it turns out that Telex still lives. I don't know how many of you still remember what Telex is, but Telex is alive and well in the world of international cargo transfer. Telex, fax machines, physical pieces of paper, chops, with ink and the signature. All of those systems are all melded together. Why do they still exist? Because the complexity of moving all those people into a new system is high and the cost of failure is even higher. And so you look at it and you go, it would be a good idea if we changed it, but how are we going to do it? It's really hard to raise money as a startup when you're looking at a 
big, complex problem like that. Nice, simple problems. One of the things that blockchain and cryptocurrencies have ended up doing is enabling some companies to have large amounts of money quickly out of the end. One of the big advantages we had out of this crypto boom, this ISO boom, was that some companies ended up with large amounts of money. Some of it got wasted. Some people have ended up faking their deaths in India. All sorts of things happen. But some of it has actually become useful. And that useful, and we've seen this before, we've seen this in other technology ways before, where, where large amounts of money was wasted, large amounts of money has been used. And I'm going to argue that a lot of that money that was being used is being used to actually start building infrastructure. And that infrastructure is really, at the moment, looking more like a messaging system. But it's really a messaging system to message between organizations. The way that Kevin talks about it is the messaging being passed is in the in the version one of the technology is essentially money, value, cryptocurrencies. Um, and we're moving now into a system where, we're move, where we are associating that, uh, that token, that unit, with maybe money, it might be coal, it might be spinach, but also with the metadata that goes around it. A ton of coal in a coal mine in Brazil is of a different value than a ton of coal in a ship in the Atlantic is a different value to that ton of coal when it's approaching the Japanese coast or the Chinese coast. And the fact that we have now the computing power to be able to manage and process these very, very large amounts of data have, um, oh, oh, and then the artificial intelligence that's starting to come up, which allows us to process it, has suddenly given us um, value to that data. And the question is, how do you move it around the world? And the argument is that actually the internet itself is simply a pipe. It does it moves it from A to B, but it doesn't actually move it in a structured way. And that what blockchain really is doing in its broadest sense is providing a, an interchange mechanism, a way of, of, of exchanging trusted information from one part to the other. And so we've now got a different form of communication. What we saw with version 1.0 of, of Bitcoin, as I like to call it, was the proof that you can trust in technology. Previously, we would trust in, trust you because I know you, and therefore I will lend you $10. Maybe I'll lend Kevin five, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, or I trust you because we're the same religion, I trust you because we're the same tribe, and then we move to trust in, in the state, as I've learned, being around lawyers for a little while. Um, and what, what version one of the technology proved is that we have some trust in technology. And that trust in technology now, us, now allows us to move value around the internet in the same way that you would move packets of data. So if you think of the internet as a, as, as a way of getting a packet of data from A to B, we now got this ability to move value from A to B. Um, what we're now seeing is a series of well-funded companies. Now, obviously, there are companies that made their money out of the coin offerings, but you're now seeing another generation of companies that, that have been venture-backed to an equally large degree, which shows that there is a funding depth behind this. And with that large amount of money, they're able to take on, on head-on uh, existing, existing players who have a centralized approach to managing that flow of value. And the two classic examples are the Visa Network and Swift. And if I went out tomorrow, you know, if I went out without all this prior experience and said, I'm going to build a competitor to Swift, I'm going to build a, a competitor to, to Visa, give me $100 million, it would be hard to do. But the fact we've actually got companies that have that money and they pick that as their mission has suddenly made those sort of companies, those centralized companies, within the sites of, of startups. And we see that whether those startups succeed or fail, their impact on those companies has been dramatic. Swift has decreased their fees, increased their, uh, changed their voting structure, changed their management structure, um, reduced their messaging delay. So it has an effect. What I'm arguing is that essentially this, this, this version 2.0 of blockchain is taking a direct aim at those central 
uh, organizations, whether it's the way that shares are organized, the way that coal is transported, the way that money is organized, and that is organized, and that they are taking a head-on aim at those central organizations. Um, I know my colleagues disagree with that, so I'm going to pass it over to them. All right, well, we'll see. Shaka. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I love how Kevin and David have uh, laid out you know, some nice examples as well. The angle that I'm coming at it from is the business opportunities and challenges of, of blockchain. What I concern myself with is really the strategic and organizational question, which is you know, when or whether to adopt such a technology, especially amidst all the hype right now and the promise, but also how to do so if I were to do so. You know, because I think it's... There are a lot of these questions that both Kevin and David identified so nicely, but if I'm now sitting there as a general manager, not even as a person who's a CTO or the technology side, I have to make a decision about it, what do I do? So a much more simplistic approach. I think the examples that you heard are very, very powerful. I mean, essentially from a business point of view, I can see three benefits coming, uh, three major benefits. I mean, one is that the transaction costs can certainly be lowered. A second potential benefit is that we can actually get increased revenues through better interaction between different parties. Consider your customers, for example, and, and therefore higher revenues, and maybe even increased time to market. You know? So how would these things play out? I mean, one, in the financial system, you know, both of you talked about it already. If I can move money faster around, then that clearly has ripple effects for the entire system, so that's a fairly easy one. If I'm, though, Johnson & Johnson or Glaxo, you know, and I'm concerned about are these ingredients in the compounds original, or are the drugs being counterfeited? How can I track it along the way? Much like the shipping example with customs as well, the beer does that with diamonds, and there's an interesting angle there, because we heard about you know, blood diamonds, we've talked about that, and so if you can share and, and basically suggest that, you know, no, I can track everything, that not only has a benefit in terms of actually knowing the purity of our diamonds and perhaps where it's coming from, but also, might have a positive spin-off in terms of the PR effects. Perhaps one of my favorite examples is in music. So uh, right now, what happens on various platforms, pick your favorite one, maybe Spotify, is that the artists themselves, they get compensated with their royalties in a rather archaic fashion, once a quarter or so. Uh, a check is sent to them, essentially, after someone goes through and adds up how many downloads people have in some uh, really made of their songs. And I think we can change these things. Now, so that's the promise. Where are the challenges from a business point of view and, and how do they really work? One has to do with the financial side. It's actually really hard for us to quantify the gains in terms of these different facets, whether it's the cost, the time to market, the revenue side. And because it requires a network to really be successful, who actually appropriates those gains, right? So if I'm talking about a supply chain, who will benefit the most, right? I mean, that's one of the questions that we have to answer. A second has to do with the technical side, but more, uh, you know, there are technical issues that need to be resolved, but more than that, how can I actually make the investments and how do I deal with legacy infrastructure if I move to another platform? Related to that, though, is this question of, I don't have any standards or dominant designs in place. So I really like Kevin's characterization of a class of technologies that's really working its way through the system, and we haven't quite decided this is a standard, for instance. There are different coalitions battling it out. But that means that I, as a company, have to think about that issue. Do I want to bet on something now, or do I wait a little bit? A third feature is organizationally. I mean, not that many people know about blockchain, how to use it, how to implement it yet. And so I need to find those capabilities internally or externally. And then finally, we've alluded to it, the regulatory environment is not yet set. And what's interesting about the regulatory side is that different countries or regions may take a different approach, especially when it comes to dealing with fundamental systems like the financial system, where such technologies are allowed might be different in, say, China, which can use benefit from financial inclusion, or Kenya or India, versus others like the Western countries who don't want to see potentially a repeat of what happened in the financial crisis. So how would I as a firm approach some of these questions, especially the question of in view of these challenges, when do I adopt or do I need it at this moment or should I wait a little bit longer? One of the ways I like to think about this is along two dimensions. The first dimension is, is the infrastructure ready? So do I have secure, scalable platforms for being able to set up? Uh, and do I do so in a private network amongst say supply chain members whom I know already or do I go right out to my customers? A second question is, what is the nature of my interactions? Is it that I have a high volume of interactions with many different parties? 
and a high risk of non-compliance, perhaps, in these counterparty interactions. And if not, do I need it? So some, some, if you go by that, some companies definitely will need it. So shipping or any of these retail companies will definitely be ones where they can go for it. Whether the infrastructure is ready or not is the other question. But from the point of view of the transaction need, it's very much there. I ask myself the question, though, is does, for example, an Uber or an Airbnb need it? Or is the existing infrastructure sufficient for handling all these different transactions? For the moment, it seems to suffice. And, and uh, we don't quite need to go to a blockchain type solution, but that might change in the future. At the moment, it seems to be working perfectly fine. If we go a little bit further on this front, well, if I wanted to adopt it, let's say I have a lot of transactions, a lot of parties, some risk in terms of payment, I want to uh, encode these smart contracts, and the infrastructure can be made private and, and, and very uh, scalable and very secure, then how do I go about doing it? We see a lot of different examples. I can go an organic approach, I can do an alliance or partner approach, or I can do an acquisition approach. So for example, the major tech players, uh, such as the IBMs or the Googles, are of course developing their own technologies and doing it on their own, both for their own needs, think about an Amazon Web Services, as well as for clients of theirs. But then you've got a Walmart who is looking at, how do I track the pork that's coming from China? This is an actual example. Uh, what do I do? So they partner with IBM in order to adopt the transaction manager solution in order to work on that. And then Spotify tried to solve the royalty problem by buying a company called Media Chain. And Media Chain was quite uh, interested in it as well. It's a startup company. They made it in-house and decided that they want to try this on their own. I think importantly, even as the technology is evolving and we see a lot of uncertainty in the standards and the investments we have to make and the capabilities we need, what's important is to stay close to our partners, to work with the supply chain. And for me personally, where I see this going is the first phase is work with your existing partners whom you have in the supply chain. Phase two is branching out more broadly to customers at large. Well, uh, I feel terrible. Um, I feel terrible because I listened to the three panelists uh, before me, and I, I think, wow, this is a really exciting, innovative uh, medium that sort of has this great promise, not just to help artists and people who are using chops on chips, but uh, maybe to transform our lives. And I'm going to present to you some research that's both uh, on a smaller bore set of questions um, and also that's sort of retrospective. So I'm going to sort of a little bit do of a, a little cadaver digging. Right, sort of what the past looked like. And that's never as exciting as what the future could look like. So I feel bad that I'm the Eeyore, but of course I'm the law professor, so it makes sense. <laughs> to be both more concrete and more pessimistic. So, um, you know, well, I'm going to talk about ICOs. So ICOs, initial coin offerings, are not actually that interesting compared to the things that we've talked about so far. And they're not even that practically important, although there are, you know, 5 to $15 billion in that market. That's a trivial amount of money compared to the real financial market. Um, there are a couple thousand firms, maybe, that have made some, some currency from that form. That's a trivial number of firms compared to the real economy. So this is a pretty small board problem. So I'm um, still going to talk about it, because that's the research I brought to you with, and that's what we're going to do. Um, so you know, what is an ICO? ICO in its platonic form is essentially a form of uh, crowdfunding, in which the thing that's being sold is a piece of code. And the piece of code is going to maybe give you some rights to participate in a future deployed network. That's the idea. You're going to get to use the token as a way to access a future network that's going to exist. You don't actually have to get those rights. The network doesn't actually have to exist, and you might not get anything else. And in 2016 and 2017, this was a really popular, at least for a period of time, um, way of raising money for certain firms that might not otherwise have access to capital. And what did it promise? It promised an end run on the ordinary ways of raising capital, which would have required inter intermediaries. And intermediaries, you could have trusted the people who Kevin suggested maybe they would lose your trust, but you'd certainly have to pay. Those intermediaries would be bankers and lawyers. And so they're obviously, from my perspective, terrible. Um, but that was, the, that was the idea. You were going to walk away from intermediaries and deploy the, the code and, and sell it. And the project that I got involved in, as I sort of got a little bit interested in this, in this space, was to try to look at the code that had been deployed. Think of that code as a form of rights, rights that were being given to the investors in the project, and compare that code to the marketing promises that were being made or the marketing disclosures that were made in the white papers, which is just sort of a fancy way, way of describing a web page um, with a particular font. Um, and the, the web page would say, here are the kinds of rights that you get as associated with our project. You might have an actual contract that was a sales contract. 
Um, and, uh, the team and I, a team of uh, law students and engineers and, and business students that Penn was able to help me put together, took the 50 largest by money raised projects of 2017 at the height of the bubble for ICO. <coughs> so in some ways, we we're shooting fish in a barrel. Like we kind of knew what we were going to get. We were going to get a bunch of, of projects that sort of had over, over promised and underdelivered. Um, that's what you get when you analyze a bubble. So we took the 50 biggest projects and we said, can we code the token rights and the associated smart contracts that came with those tokens? And we compare the rights, the governance rights that the, those tokens had given to the rights that were promised. So um, this is the this is the, the story that we, we got. Um, the first big right we look at was supply. So if you're promising the right to participate in a future network and the token is a sort of instantiation of that right, the number of tokens that you have obviously should be related to their price and there should be some value to credibly being able to say we're only going to issue so many tokens going forward. And so it turns out nine out of our ten projects, 89 percent, promised some kind of limitation on supply, which is not surprising. And it turns out that promising a limitation is a, a positively associated with value. So if you promise that you're going to limit supply, you're able to, to raise some more money. Of those, 75% delivered it through code. So that's a pretty good, uh, that's a pretty good result. Uh, some of you are recent graduates from Penn. 75% definitely is passed. <laughs> <laughs> and it was probably passing even a long time ago. It's, it's, a good, it's, a good, it's a good number, I think it's fair to say. 24% did not, but you know, who knows? It's, things get broken when you make an egg. Um, so the next big one, and maybe this one's more um, important, and certainly if you're a Wharton uh, person, you really probably care about that, is vesting. So, um, if you're going to be a young person these days, which gosh, I wish I were, and you suddenly were endowed with an enormous amount of money, there might be some temptation to go buy an island and live on it in a place where the US jurisdictional authorities can't reach. And so um, if you can credibly be able to promise, look, I'm not going to have access to the capital that I'm going to get for a period of time, if it's going to be vested or not going to be given to me, that should be super valuable to investors. And it turns out 80% of the firms that we studied of the 50, 80% promised some sort of vesting rule. But, 78% uh, of those, or 80%, essentially did not deliver it. And so it might be that there are soft contracts, what we used to call contracts, um, that uh, sort of lock down those rights, that there might have actually been options that were written between the founders of the firm um, and themselves. But the investors don't have a way to audit that or know about that. Uh, it's not public on GitHub, obviously, whether there's a, a vesting, a vesting um, option contract. So we didn't think that was fantastic. And then the last thing that we looked at was non-modifiability. So one of the things that was often talked about in the 2016-2017 period of time was that when one of the advantages you get through blockchain is it's immutable. That's less often talked about today, and, and certainly Kevin didn't talk about it as much in his, his speech as he might have in 2017. It sort of was a big thing that people talked about. Sort of, you get a, a series of rights that are not going to be easily changed. Um, now, from a lawyer's perspective, this seems crazy. Like, why would you ever start an organization you can't change? The world changes, people change, and you would obviously want to be able to change the governance rights within the organization. But from a techno-libertarian perspective, it makes some sense to think, well, you get what you get and you don't get upset. So we started to look at the, the projects, and it turns out that 20% of the projects retain the ability to modify um, the project essentially at will through uh, sort of a deployed opt-out mechanism. And of those, 60% did not disclose that power to modify the rights that you got. So if you're a lawyer, I know there's at least a handful of lawyers in the room. I can, I can see your faces are gleaming with law. Um, if you're a lawyer, you would think of it as sort of blank check stock. So a, a set of uh, stock issuances that have the rights that are going to be determined later and are totally within the discretion of the issuer. And that's a really dangerous thing to give, especially if you're giving currency for that, because you haven't gotten anything except for whatever the issue wants to tell you you're going to have later. Now, you might think to yourself, that sounds a lot like my credit card, because your credit card does have uh, sort of a, we can modify this at will at any time, and you know, you're out of luck. We can suddenly increase your interest rate. But of course, you can walk away with your credit card, um, and you can form a new relationship with a new issuer. Well, it's here, you can't get your money back. So we saw that as a bunch of evidence that the investment protection side of the ICO market, at least in 2017, wasn't working particularly well. So what flows from that? So I started by saying, who cares? This is a pretty small market, and it is, and, and, and uh, that's true. And you might say to yourself, look, if the folks who are investors in the 2017 market lose their shirts, that's a great lesson. 
um, because they shouldn't be participating in markets that are unregulated, um, which this market was not particularly regulated. Um, and they should be sort of, sort of thought to themselves like, look, it's a, it's, they lost their money, these are just sort of dangerous. I think from my perspective, that might be true. But the big thing I think about, or the worry that I have is, what do we think about the future of sort of blockchain intermediated currency and blockchain intermediated finance? And the, the worry I have is that the, the market, at least in 2017 and 2018, should give us pause about whether coded investment protection, sort of that kinds of um, smart contract rules that we're thought to be able to provide um, consumer protection, are going to work particularly well. The number of people who can both read smart contracts, read token code, and who can also read disclosures at the same time, because that's what you need to be able to do. You need to do both. Like, it, it's essentially a null set, unless you bring together a lot of law students and business students and engineering students and you pay them. Um, and so you say, well, fine, we might get intermediaries to come forward to sort of start validating the things that these projects are going to put out. And the intermediaries might be certified by the government. And the government might be involved. And that just ends up being thinking, we're just back to the ordinary capital markets. And if so, the SEC should be sort of forthrightly right than it has done so traditionally. So that's where I come out, and that's why I sort of feel bad, because I, I hear you guys talk, and I think, wow, this is a pretty exciting future. And then I hear myself talk, and I think, wow, we get back to, to Goldman and to, to, to Lethem and to Goldman, uh, to, um, to Wachtell, and, and the future looks a lot like the past. And on the other hand, the, the past has been pretty good for Penn, so um, I think we're sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, future's pretty good for Penn, too. Well, let me, let me turn that to the other two of you to, to start. Would you agree with that, that, that this is all going to re-centralize, or is there any, not just the ICOs, but you know, in, in general, in terms of these systems, or, or is there hope for this promise of using tokens and using these decentralized mechanisms to build systems that are really different than the ones we've had before? So I ask that in two different ways. From an engineering point of view, you've got this trade-off. You're trying to trade off security, decentralization, and scale. And the easiest thing to trade off is to move towards a more centralized network. In other words, you reduce the number of nodes, you reduce the number of players, and that simplifies it down. It's the ultimate case where you have one which looks like a centralized network, which is where we are now. And I can see that going on now, and I think it's going to be very, very hard to push it back the other way. So in that respect, I think the, the actual networks you're seeing out there in their desire to take on head, to, head on, we are going to be as fast as Visa, we're going to be as big as Swift, whatever else, are inherently going to trade off uh, decentralization because it's the easiest one to get. So that's from a technology answer point of view. From a how they operate, they are trying to get rid of that central point that that store and forward, the idea that there's somebody in the middle who gathers everything up, brings it all together, and then reissues it out again. And they're trying to do that in real time and try and do it as much as they And I think in that respect, they're going to be successful. And that's where this money that's being piled in is going to get used effectively. In the same way, when you look at back at the internet, where did we start off? We started off with a store and forward system with telephone exchanges, basically. All the wires came into one place, there was a switch, and the switch switched everything out, they went back out the other part. Um, what we've got here is the beginnings of a way of doing this decentralized switching of value, the way you're able to move value. And that value might be money, but it might also be the tokenized representation of coal. Um, and when I hear David talk about smart contracts, I'm far more optimistic because I essentially go, Really, what those smart contracts are now are built into those train systems. They're the things that are pulling the levers, that are moving the value this way or that way. And they are um, inside networks, so at a level where uh, the participant, where they're wrapped in legal structures, the legal structures for providing the, the, the assurance. Those are the switches, those are the elves inside. That's my answer. I, um, I also fundamentally believe we will get to a decentralized system because I think the power of all the benefits is very, very strong. And the uh, analog to the internet is uh, extremely compelling. But as far as I'm concerned, I think 
we'll see it happen in different industries at a different pace, you know, and that will be the test cases, right? So with the financial system, I can see a lot of resistance for some time. Uh, even on the cryptocurrency question, you know, is it going to be a third party cryptocurrency like a Bitcoin or will it be governments getting together and trying to figure something out, right? But then we can make it more easily work. In the industrial sense, in all the industries that we were talking about, I think it's a very natural thing that uh, we will move to that sooner rather than later and we can try it and then basically build that trust. I think one of the challenges is that there's this premise out there of unhackable or uneditable, you can't change the information, etc. It's hard for me to buy that premise quite yet. In theory it's there, but we're already seeing hackers now turn their attention to these things, right? It's like saying Mac is more secure than Windows, but that has to do with how many users, for example, were on that and where hackers turn their attention. So that's the place where I have some concern. I think it'll take some time, but some will be natural lead industries and we'll learn from that. So, and I'll, I'll jump in that I, I think there's actually three different phenomena going on here that we lump together as blockchain. Uh, one is what um, a number of us have talked about, which is using these decentralized ledgers as a tracking platform for anything. Um, that's where a lot of the enterprise and the business activity is. Um, one is about creating new kinds of decentralized systems, uh, creating systems where basically you treat the blockchain as a kind of computer that's running applications and the, the tokens, the, the asset of value, is the incentive structure uh, that's powering the applications and also incentivizing activity on those systems. That's the part that is uh, the most immature, the most uh, uncertain, the most radical. Um, but one that um, there's a great deal of activity going to, a number of projects uh, in very sophisticated ways, trying to create mechanisms that overcome the problems that, that David talked about, um, where the implementations lag with the vision. Um, so, you know, the greatest potential to be transformative, but, you know, the highest risk that it will not actually happen. And then the third category, which I don't think we really talked about yet, is, you know, crypto asset trading. Is basically, um, once you take this uh, asset, this token, as a true representation of value, then you can plug it into trading platforms, where you don't really care what's going on below the hood. It's just you understand you can take this asset financialize it, securitize it, create derivatives on top of it, um, and create markets. And the financial system is really good at creating markets. So that's why you see groups like Fidelity and the New York Stock Exchange, and a lot of these traditional financial services players who at first blush people think would be totally disintermediated by this technology, actually investing in building platforms to trade because there's demand um, from investors who want liquidity, and if this can provide it, um, that actually can happen a lot more quickly than the other two categories because it's the least radical, um, but it, it's the one that, that is the least transformative. That's, that's my sense of this. Um, but, um, but reasonable minds may differ. Um, so let me, uh, let me go back to you, David. So you, you sort of alluded to the question of regulation, um, that uh, part of what happened in 2017 was we had this bubble because there wasn't a lot of regulatory activity. What do you see happening now? What do you see going forward? how much is regulation going to rein in some of the abuses and how much re regulation is going to rein in some of the potential benefits of the technology? So um, on, the, you know, on the relatively uninteresting ICO front, and I think we're probably going to see in the next couple weeks uh, to months, I think we're going to see SEC guidance coming out. It's been promised multiple times in the last quarter and the government shutdown slowed things down a bit. It's with the commissioners right now and the, the guidance is probably going to give us a more clear sense of which of the kinds of ICO um, issuances are the back securities and require the full panoply of the disclosure regime, which of them are going to be kind of safe harbored, um, which of them are going to require a callback, and that's going to come relatively soon. That ought to settle a lot of our the sorts of questions that we have. Um, at the same time, the um, CTIC um, is uh, working, I think, on some currency um, issues, uh, so we're going to get some clarity on that as well. They have a internal shop that you can go to right now that answer lots of questions and they've been talking about uh, guiding documents. So we're going to get a lot of clarity in 2019 even though the larger political system seems like it has lots of sort of friction in the gears. I think there's a lot of alignment and incentives around doing uh, particular uh, regulatory guidance. 
There is some proposed legislation on the Hill, and I mean, legislation takes years, and even in, in today's political climate, who knows? Um, there are different versions and competing versions of what uh, a legislative set of uh, uh, pieces of clarity. There's a Token Taxonomy Act through the Blockchain Caucus, which I think hasn't picked up that many Democratic uh, sponsors, and so I sort of don't think that's particularly going anywhere right now. Um, but you could imagine um, uh, an amendment to the securities uh, laws that if, we, if the SEC got behind it, um, which would give us a sense of where we're going going forward. The big, I think, unanswered and really wicked set of problems from my perspective are custody problems. And so if you're a large institution like Fidelity or um, you know, a broker-dealer, you've got lots of rules that uh, you have to follow if you're going to hold assets for your clients. And it's not actually very possible to hold crypto assets right now um, in the sort of the, the um, interrelationship between the custody rules and actually how these products work. And so there is a huge demand for change of the custodial uh, laws. Um, whether or not Congress has an appetite to make that change um, is not obvious to me. I don't know that the regulators can themselves sort of create the, create the kind of clarity that I would need if I was a, a lawyer advising you know, Goldman or a large firm that has real assets at stake to hold crypto assets. And I think that in some ways, if you think about the next sort of big set of institutional moves here, that would require there to be more clarity on custody, and that, that clarity is not yet obvious to me. Is this going to be an area where countries compete and try to attract investment by having a more favorable regulatory climate? Um, favorable is a word. So you can think of it as uh, permissive. Yeah, so you're definitely going to get a, a regulatory competition around permissiveness. And there obviously already is. Um, uh, I should have mentioned that. There's lots of different competing models. Um, from a US uh, center perspective, which is the only perspective I have, uh, so uh, from a US center perspective, um, the, the, um, the big Transnational competition hasn't really yet started, so Gibraltar has a really interesting set of regulations, um, but it's not like a huge number of firms are running to Gibraltar uh, yet. Um, and there has been some action in the UK and some action in Germany, but they're relatively risk averse right now, and apparently they've got some sort of um, uh, which makes it hard to sort of um, uh, co uh, have um, coherent regulatory solutions. Um, uh, Yes, there's going to be regulatory competition. Yes, there's going to be a potential race to the bottom. But if you think about what the actual thing that folks want is, they want to be able to have the, the, trans, the, the national set of laws that enable them to have a well-functioning firm, the employment laws, the, the regulatory situation. And they also want the permissive um, crypto laws at the same time. And that's not something you're going to easily get. The fact that you can sort of you know, incorporate the Gibraltar doesn't really do you any good um, if most of your operating work is going to be done in the home country. So I, I, I'm not quite as worried. I mean, when I talk to people in crypto space, they say, well, we don't change our laws now. Gibraltar is going to do something. Oh, it will. Um, but that's not necessarily the end all of um, the space. Um, so, Saika, you made a really interesting point about how it's challenging to actually quantify the benefits uh, of blockchain technology, even if we, conceptually we can map them out. So. Uh, how do firms, or how could firms, or, or will firms overcome that barrier? I think that's a really um, good question. I think we would treat it much like we do an ecosystem nowadays. So, for example, if you look at you know, ecosystem-based competition is much more popular. Take a look at how Android took on the Apple ecosystem, for example, or how the airlines compete as Star Alliance or Sky Team or One World. Um, so I think it has to be something where there's a bit more of a coordinated effort, right? And, and there's a value generation idea and uh, some sense of the rules in terms of how do we share the spoils, at least initially. Now, we can't quite control that. When Google decided to go all in with the Android system, they thought that they would appropriate most of the share of that ecosystem. In fact, it's the handset makers, and if you saw how much uh, Samsung is going to be charging for its foldable phone, something to the tune of $1,500 or $1,700, you can see that some people will pay for it. It may not end up that way, but the important implication there is that how the value is generated in that system and how it's appropriated will determine how much it will be picked up, because we've got a lot of these big players, and they may not play ball if it doesn't make sense for them. David Krause, we're going to talk about how firms get over the hump, and David and I, as you mentioned, co-taught a class 
last semester for both undergraduates and MBAs, and one of the things that we did was we assigned them to real world blockchain projects, all different sorts of things, small game startups to very large uh, multinational corporations that were doing blockchain and supply chain, and I had them look at this question of uh, you know, what it actually takes to get things deployed. So I'm, I'm curious your, your thoughts at this point about how firms can actually make the case. So looking at the examples we found from industry, if the industry has a control, I mean, I look at one, for example, a financial services firm that has data from multiple providers. They buy that data. They use a third party to put that data into a particular format, and then they use it internally. So they have this idea of pulling data from multiple sources, getting somebody to mix it together and provide a single stream. Moving that towards a distributed system where, every, where you can trace the, the origin of the data all the way back. In other words, there's no magic mixer in the middle. Uh, improves the transparency of the system and you can see why that is a very attractive application for it. You can see why other players in that particular financial services space would want to come in as well because in the end, they're all following an index. Everybody wants to share the same index. They want to have the same, same idea of truth. They share a vision of truth. So that's the ones that I think is being successful because you can see transparency all the way down. Uh, the other one that I see as being fascinating is where the barriers between inside the company and outside the company start breaking down. If you are a company that makes soup, then you traditionally have a whole bunch of internal systems. You take chickens in one side, you get cans out the other side. If you're facing competition from a whole bunch of small vendors who are making organic soups in all sorts of different shapes and sizes and they are locally produced, how do you compete? Well, one way is to ignore it. The second is to essentially take the Amazon approach where you say that we will allow those vendors to have access to part of our system. We are really good at stocking supermarket shelves. We are really good at supplying things. We are really good at dealing with the agricultural invest, uh, inspection regime. And we start to essentially Amazon ourselves up. We start to break ourselves up and allow you to buy any piece of it. One of the interesting things about using a blockchain-based solution is that inherently, if you employ it internally and externally, then the barrier between what's inside and what's outside fades away, which now means that anybody who's on the outside could equally be on the inside. So they could be chicken farmers, but they could also be a broth, a local broth manufacturer who wants to be having their broth canned in your can plant and then shipped back to them to be put on their local stand. So, um, so those are the two examples that I've seen have worked really well from, from, from the case studies we've done. So you can have your broth and eat it too. <laughs> Absolutely, it's going to be good for you. Uh, so one more question for all of you, and then I want to open it up to the, the audience. Um, do the cryptocurrencies come back? Uh, you, know, you mentioned, David, the, you know, the ICO phenomenon you know, sort of being something in hindsight, but 2017, that was it, and there was this tremendous frenzy um, both on the investment side, but also people saying, look, this is going to change the way firms raise capital. It's going to displace the VC, and it's going to lead to all these new structures. Um, is that whole period over for good? Uh, or are we going to see a, a shift back that maybe is on a more regulated foundation, but we'll start to see more activity around the tokens themselves? Well, if I could predict that, I certainly would quit my job and and make a lot of money, um, uh, so it should be great. Um, so you know, the, all of the, the research that I've seen suggests that ICO prices are essentially tethered to Bitcoin, um, and so you know the the, the the correlation is something like a 0.97 for a basket of ICO prices. And so the question of whether ICOs are coming back is basically the same question of whether Bitcoin price comes back, which suggests to me that like the as an independent story about whether or not you can unlock firm specific value, the answer is no, um, at least in the current version of the ICO market. Now, lawyers are definitely involved in this space, trying to create security tokens or other versions of the thing, and you know, the SEC could provide guidance, and we might get a different kind of financial product. 
where the people who are the originators of the firm could really separate themselves out from the larger market, and that would be an interesting moment. It hasn't happened yet, you don't really know. Um, uh, but you know, I'm a big believer in the past, and what the past tells us is that no, um, that this particular form is not um, itself a particularly um, um, transformational way of unlocking capital value. So that's my bad answer. I think um, I don't have the same empirical basis to make my claims. Uh, I think from a business proposition point of view, having cryptocurrencies is valuable. The question, though, is for me, what is it exactly? Is it an actual currency, or is it a security that we trade in some ways? We have to figure that out a little bit. The second question that arises for me is, does it need to be a third party, or is it more, uh, a, is it more powerful if it's actually backed by someone? You know? If you pull out your just any kind of currency, the only reason that that piece of paper is worth something is because somebody's backing it, right? And then there's this fundamental question that we're saying, well, what's the backing here and how stable is it? So we need to resolve it. But the power of having a currency of that sort is, I think, something we're going to find difficult to get away from. So I look at this slightly different, and I look at in order for a current cryptocurrency to have value, it has to be defendable. A tax on cryptocurrencies of these 51% attacks. And what we saw with the Ethereum classic attack, Ethereum is essentially what happened is you can, the, the currencies themselves are split, you can have different versions of them. So what we saw at the beginning of this year was a particular currency which was fairly recently called Ethereum classic, uh, was attacked and people would essentially double spend the money or, or steal it. You know, find steel. Um, <laughs> the research we've been doing is showing that these these attacks are becoming easier. And one of the reasons they become easier is that the price of cryptocurrencies have dropped, which means that there's a glut of uh, mining equipment out of the market. And you can see that when you go onto eBay. You can see mining rigs that were thousands of dollars being available for $50. Why are they so cheap? Well, because when you mine, you burn up lots of energy, um, and so you you need so you you there's a ratio between how much currency you're going to get back and how much energy you have to really spend out. Now, if you're just going out to steal currency by doing a 51% attack, you don't really care how much energy you burn. So, one of the things we've been doing with our students is going on eBay and buying rigs. And it turns out you can buy quite, you can build yourself quite a large assembly of, of, of mining equipment for short change. And then the amazing thing is you can turn around and sell it back on eBay from the sort of paper. So actually, you've got the ability now to actually build quite significant attack uh, platforms. And I think what that's going to do is start to put under pressure things like Ethereum Classic, which and the others that, that just don't have the critical mass. And it's going to clean the market out. So anybody who's looking vulnerable is going to get pushed out sooner or later to get attacked. And so we're going to end up going back to just a very small number of people. <coughs> so on that happy note, let's open it up for questions. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, not at all. No, yes. Can all of you comment on, can you, can you hear me? Yes. Can all of you comment on what I, I think you put, if you press the button, I think the mic will go on. We, we can hear you OK, but yeah, see if we can do it. Bingo. Great. There we go. Can all of you comment on research you've been doing in areas outside the financial services industry, outside coins, in areas that centralization and therefore the adoption or applicability of blockchain? And, and a quick example would be the aviation sector, which in the US and Europe is moving from centralized air traffic control to a distributed system of air traffic management and coordinated activity each plane is a part on a node. So what is the research you're doing outside financial services and what are your findings? Uh, well, so I'll start. So I, you know, I've, I've, I've done some research. I'm a, I'm a legal scholar by training, so I've, I've done some research on um, smart contracts, um, on how they interface with law, and also some, some broader work on regulation. But uh, the work I'm doing right now is in, in two areas. One is governance, um, which is you know, there, in, in any of these systems, uh, if you try to build a decentralized system, the question is how does it make decisions and how does it evolve? And we have lots of models of governance, um, but um, they you know, apply imperfectly to these new kinds of mechanisms where 
Um, either there's no one in charge or there are these different actors that may be in charge. There's miners and there's developers and there's users and then you get these tokens and you can build very sophisticated um, economic incentive based game theoretic systems around the tokens uh, but that doesn't necessarily get you the, the governance solution where governance is often about exception handling. So you know, when do you go around the rules and how do you deal with that? So uh, looking at that and trying to draw upon lessons of governance in various other domains in which there's a lot of, of both empirical work and, and theoretical work. Um, that's a project I'm involved in right now. Don't have results yet, but, but you know, trying to work in that direction. And then uh, I'm starting in on a project that sort of is along the, the veins of what you're talking about, but again is, is early stage, which is we actually don't have a, a good sense of what all the real world activity is around blockchain applications, especially these enterprise and government applications. There's a few very well-known examples, um, but there um, anecdotally seem to be a whole lot more that, you know, that are not massive scale, but that are actually in production. So you know, I talked to Brian Ballendorf, who leads Hyperledger, which is one of the, the enterprise blockchain consortia. They have 50 production systems running on this open source software. That's, that's, 50 networks um, in different, in all kinds of different industries, mostly not financial services, where the blockchain is actually the system of record, where it's actually you know, real transaction data running over. Now, what those are, how big those are, um, no one really knows. And in fact, even Brian doesn't really know. Um, so um, so that, that's something that, that we're, we're starting to move down is to try to look at the kinds of examples where, where you know, it's, it's one thing to define a use case and say it might be useful here, but what are people actually doing and you know, how can we compare them and so forth. So uh, again, not projects that are yet at, at completion, but those are two of the directions I'm going. Um, it's great, uh, great question. Um, both Kevin and I are really interested in smart contracts. So the, the kind of questions, I, mean, I think it's a really interesting metaphor whether smart contracts really are contracts. And Kevin's written about that, I think, most persuasively. Um, I see there's some, some Ripple folks here, so I've actually um, just started on a Ripple uh, branded project to try to gather as many examples of actual functioning smart contracts, not sort of toy projects, but real functioning smart contracts as we possibly can, and take a look at the code in a level of granular detail and try to understand what kind of legal problems that coded legal governance regime creates. And the one that I think is most conceptually interesting is that many legal regulatory systems, just like bankruptcy, for example, exists largely because parties don't fully specify their agreements. Um, so they leave gaps in the kind of things that they, that they have in the regulatory system exists to fill the gap in the back end after everything goes to hell. Um, and the question is, how many gaps are left in functioning smart contract systems that we have in the world? And how should we think about filling those gaps? And one of the interesting sort of um, things that I, I'm really trying to learn a little bit about is when, as many of you will know, that when coders write code, they write lots of commentary. Um, in the code itself, especially if you're a well-functioning project, not sort of a fly-by-night ICO, but like a real um, uh, coded enterprise. And the question is, what do you do with those, those comments? The comments are going to say, here's what this is supposed to do. And then sometimes it doesn't, and sometimes it doesn't. And from a legal perspective, that dissonance between what the coders intend and what the code does and what the actual agreement so there's a sort of like a tonic agreement that exists, maybe it's orally formed, or maybe there's an actual written um, semantic uh, contract, is really interesting. Um, that sort of the gaps between it and what should the law do, whether courts or regulatory systems, is something that I'm, I'm thinking about, and I, I don't know what the answers are going to look like. I think, broadly speaking, where I'm looking at decentralization is um, companies getting decentralized. If you look at it with the phenomenon of outsourcing, it's moved from low-end peripheral activities to high-end knowledge-intensive activities. The way the Dreamliner was constructed, notwithstanding all the issues that happened, where individual players and suppliers were able to take on a lot more decision-making and innovation. Uh, what we can do with cloud services, for example, where banks are giving their data to be stored and often analyzed to come up with uh, risk profiles of key customers by a third party provider like an Amazon Web Services or an analytics firm that uses that data, get, which is stored on AWS. I think those are all examples of decentralization in addition to the ecosystems uh, like Android as well. 
Now, it's not to the point of nobody having control, but more a system amongst itself having control, so it's not quite there. But we might look at the pure decentralization as a little bit of an asymptote. Perhaps we'll get there, but perhaps it's not quite reachable, but we might be close to it. But blockchain presents us that interesting theoretical possibility. So I was looking for the whiteboard and some markers. <laughs> um, because what I wanted to talk about was zero knowledge proofs and multi-party computation. Um, so, failing the whiteboard test, let me try and explain in more general terms. You talked about airlines. Imagine that you have a contested airline, airspace, the airspace over Syria, for example, where you have multiple competing uh, organizations, shall we call them, flying jets. You have Russians, you have Syrians, you have the Americans, you have the French. Uh, it's a really bad idea if you fly airplanes into each other. So there's an incentive for people not to do it. At the same time, you don't want to give away the fact that you're launching a raid at a particular time. So how would you have these parties share information in such a way that they reduce probability of, of, of flying sorties at the same moment, but at the same time not giving away the, the airlines' surprise? It turns out that mathematically you can do this through the sharing process, multi-party computation. And that what blockchain provides is a common method of moving data, sharing data. So every competing air force in the world would be publishing information into, onto a shared blockchain. Everyone can see it. However, they aren't able to actually read it directly. They don't know that so many airlines are assuming jets are going to take off at four o'clock tonight. All they can do is ask questions, which basically are on the lines of, I want to fly a mission. When can I fly it when I'm not going to hit anybody else? And they get an answer back of yes or no. Can I just clarify, are you saying that you're doing research relative to the concepts of operations and architectures and the underlying math for something like airspace optimization for verified data? Between so, objects moving real time, is that right? So first of all, I'm not. My colleague Brett Hemingway is. He knows what he's talking about. I don't. <laughs> um, and I can't comment on exactly how real time it is. But if you want to, I can do the introduction. Yes. So. Um, uh, I don't know if this is working. Yeah, just push the button, it'll light up, yeah. Uh, in a distributed ledger situation where everybody is involved, you have to hold it down. I'm holding it down. There you go. Yeah. So everybody's involved, but there are third parties sometimes, like the estate of the brick I hit this afternoon in my car. How was, how was the court? For that creditor going to get to all of my assets that are in the, one of the mechanism for that? Or how does a bank take a security interest in something that's in the Start well, so no, it's a really good question. And so that you know, there there was this incident that happened recently that someone alluded to. With there was an exchange called Quadriga CX, which was the biggest cryptocurrency exchange in Canada, and they announced a few weeks ago our CEO died in December in India, and he was the only one who had the keys to everyone's deposits, uh, and they're all gone, no, or they're there, but we can't access them. Um, and the story gets crazier and crazier. It appears that's not exactly what happened, but it's still contested what happened. But, but yes, this is, this is a real challenge. So, so one answer is if you just leave it to chance and just say, well, okay, this is a, a bearer system where you have the key, um, then it breaks very easily. But that doesn't mean you can't build mechanisms in. So, so David talked about custody. A very significant problem, but, but there's a lot of good work going into building custody systems that actually work. You have multiple people of access that, you know, you need two of three keys to get access and you create a system around it. Um, and then you can layer the, the legal requirements on top of that. So um, generally speaking, they aren't unsolvable problems. And, and, and the, the general answer is it turns out that courts and legal actors 
And law enforcement actors, most of the time, can find a way to grab onto something or someone. Um, it's a lot of rhetoric that these things are totally opaque and dark and out of anyone's control. Um, and most of the time, that, that's not actually the case. Um, and so I, you know, I think you know, we, we don't have people who are deliberately you know, committing crime and trying to hide things, which often there are ways to go after them anyway. Um, it's more possible than it seems for, for the legal system to, to get a, a handhold somewhere. Okay. Yes. Uh, so one of the thread lines of the talk was the need for trust, right? Okay. It's like GSK trusting in the blockchain, accurately reporting out on quality assurance, for instance. And my question is two parts. One, one, how do you envision uh, blockchain companies persuading you know these large Fortune 500 companies and trusting them with data, right, with uh, with all the information? And two, do you then envision maybe big tech, Google, Amazon, and the like getting involved that they have maybe the infrastructure or the brand credibility to say, hey, you can trust us with your data given we're already running AWS or Azure for you, for instance? Yeah, I, let me get start on this one. Um, I think that building the trust is important from a data point of view, but also that's where that financial model and the gains come in as well, right? It's ultimately a lot of this will be about aligning incentives. So if all the parties, you know, gain something from it, I think it'll be a lot easier to do that, you know? And it could be for financial reasons or it could be for others. Like the diamond industry, De Beers is an interest because they want to ensure that people know that it's not blood diamonds which are coming, right? So it may not even be the direct. Uh, the same thing happens, you know, in the pharma industry as well. Now, what I do see happening is, you know, the analogy of a keystone in sort of uh, ecology coming in handy where there is someone who provides a certain set of assets where an incentive which helps create value across the system and everybody benefits from it. That's the type of mechanism. So that's, for example, what Glaxo a GSK is doing in bringing everybody on board, you know. In the shipping industry with the customs and so forth, everybody's interest is to get this stuff done. As long as the customs enforcement agencies do get, uh, you know, whatever revenue they usually earn from it, I think that's also okay. You know, so for me, aligning incentives is a key part of it. All right, we'll take maybe one or two more, and then we'll go to the uh, reception. Yes. Can you address how the blockchain can both, on that point, address human trafficking, exploitation, the refugee crisis, and also promote positively human rights, access to capital, human dignity. What are the promises on the social impact side from where you sit? I can start on that. So, th so there are a number of um, very serious uh, blockchain for good initiatives. Um, there's, you know, World Economic Forum has a number of projects, a num number of groups have on, on all those areas you described. And um, it, it's hard to, to generalize all the way across them. But you know, often in those situations, the problem is, first of all, you're dealing with situations where uh, legal systems are not sufficient or not operable. And being able to use blockchain to track things and keep track of information and records and have it be enforceable through the technology the cryptography provides an alternative to you know, the problems of those locales not having uh, a viable system of law. Uh, but also, many of those are, are problems of tracking. Uh, there are problems of, ha you know, if you had, for example, refugees had an identity. They, they don't have state-issued identities. If you could give them a, a virtual identity on the blockchain, that's what's called a self-sovereign identity, where they control the identity. It's not that a government issues it to them. It's, it's, it's their identity, and everything else queries their identity. Um, that's potentially a way to address the delivery of services and all the other sorts of problems that, that come along with it. So it, again, it's, you've asked a very good and a very big question, and there's a whole slew of efforts in that area. Uh, it, you know, basically, the same kinds of problems many of us were talking about in the business context turn out to be problems in the in the social impact context as well. Uh, it, it's not that the you know the absence of a profit motive changes the basic structure. That there's this you know these trust gaps I talked about where you, you have this problem either that you don't want to trust some central actor, you don't want to trust, for example, a government that's an authoritarian state, or you need to put things together and overcome those trust gaps. But if I may, where finance meets 
this question. The impact investment market yeah. is looking for yeah. some hybrid. And I don't know if any of you have, have broached how we find a way to cross-articulate between sectors and be able to tell the story of, of what money will yeah. do to fortify weak government, lack of transparency. And certainly in the 70th anniversary of the Declaration of Human Rights, we still don't have anything enforceable, even where there is a rule of law. So will blockchain be kind of used to seduce people, or will it be able to bring some rigor to what we haven't achieved to date? Yes. Um, no, a a absolutely. So. Absolutely, there are initiatives in those directions. I don't know if anyone else wants to comment on that, but but it, it's still very early, uh, and um, there are you know, promising developments. Um, but uh, you know, I, I think that that's I would generalize as I said that you know there's not a lot of really good awareness and, and deep case studies that are more than kind of one-page marketing descriptions, even on the enterprise side. And the same thing is true on the social impact side. I think that's. Part of what's necessary in the next phase is, is, is to really look at what's been done, what's working, and what's not working. And, and I think you're right, the, the, the impact investment side may potentially be a driver of that in terms of putting in capital. Can I, uh, yeah. I'll just add something briefly. Uh, you know, I think the important part, just to underscore what you said, is that I think the key benefit that we're talking about here is the transparency, right? And transparency, as you acknowledge as well, is the, as the first step in solving some of these problems. You can see it in other ways, for example, where property rights are not so strong. Countries like India, for example, where someone can easily appropriate your land and you know, birth records and so forth can be falsified. I think that's also another example where governments are taking these steps and using, in fact, blockchain technology to clear that, clean that up a little bit. And that can be an important first step to then the tracking and then all the enforcement that you're talking about. All right, so this is a, a very huge space. I know there's a few more questions, but uh, we want to you know, give you all time to um, continue the chat informally outside. As I said, really exciting, lots of great potential, lots of problems and lots of risks here. Um, I don't think any of us feel like we know exactly what's going to happen, but um, it's a tremendously fascinating phenomenon. And I just want to thank everyone for a very stimulating conversation. <laughs> and thank all of you, and thank you, Christopher. So a couple closing announcements. Um, as we said, this is our hope to be a first of a series of events out here. Um, if you like what you've heard, I encourage you to give us feedback and think about future directions. I think it's a perfect example of the kinds of work that we do. Um, uh, my primary appointment is in the law school where I head the Law and Technology Center. We have the ambitions to become the preeminent program. Uh, we have a very well established, obviously, law and business program. What many of you may not know is we actually have a law and engineering program where I'm giving JDs master's in engineering. And then to try to really cross over, and it shows up in the research in a very, really rich sort of way that I think you see really taken into the discussions here. Uh, two comments. One, as we leave, I've been told we need to exit through the door here instead of that door. As I said, the bar will be open until 7.30, so you have 20 minutes. 